Good day and welcome to Epstein Becker Green's webinar, The Impact of the Changing Reimbursement Landscape on Deal Work, part of the Transacting in the Post-Acute Care Space Crash Course Series. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and that participant phone lines will be placed on mute throughout the program. You're welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx and at the end of the program, with time permitting, the speaker will address your questions. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenter following the webinar and contact informa information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the recording and access to PowerPoint materials. We are pleased to have a fantastic speaker today Elena Quattrone is an associate in the Healthcare and Life Sciences practice in the New York office of Epstein Becker Green. Ms. Quattrone assists healthcare clients in, contact, in contracting for corporate formation, mergers, acquisitions, and various other business transactions. At this time, I would like to turn the webinar over to Elena. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining me today for my presentation on post-acute care and the impact of the changing reimbursement landscape on deal work in this space. Um, as Sylvia said, my name is Elena Quattrone and I am an attorney in the healthcare and life sciences practice at Epstein Becker and Green. My background is in public health and, in, and so in my legal practice, I focus on transactions and regulatory matters within the healthcare industry. So in our brief time together this afternoon, I'd like to uh, cover the following topics. Following Anjana Patel's presentation last week, which provided an overview of post-acute care and industry trends, I will address the current reimbursement landscape for PACs. Uh, we'll be focusing primarily on federal payers like Medicare. Next, I will discuss the anticipated changes to occur that will impact reimbursement for PACs in the near future. Uh, then I will discuss how these anticipated changes to reimbursement may impact deal valuation and other transactional activities. And finally, I will provide some considerations that those looking to transact in this space should consider regarding how these changes in reimbursement will impact deal valuation and other transaction-related issues. So first, let's, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of PACs. So first, what is a PAC? To recap from Anjana's presentation last week, when we talk about PACs, we're talking about these types of facilities in decreasing levels of intensity long-term acute care facilities, or LTACs, inpatient rehabilitation facilities, uh, also called ERTS, skilled nursing facilities, called SNFs, and home health agencies, abbreviated as HHAs. Moving forward, when I talk about PAC, generally, I'm talking about these four types of facilities or programs. And the types of cases that are treated in the four types um, of PAC may overlap. Because so many Medicare beneficiaries access the services of PACs, it makes sense to focus this presentation on the changing Medicare reimbursement for these services. So in 2013, nearly half of all Medicare beneficiaries who stayed in, a, in an acute care hospital required the services of a PAC. But Medicare pays different prices for similar patients depending on where or how a patient is treated using four payment systems for PAC services which is structured in a prospective payment system, or PPS. A PPS is a method of reimbursement in which Medicare payment is based on a predetermined fixed amount. The payment amount for a particular service is derived based on the classification system of that service. In regards to PACs, these payment systems are already established based on the type of PAC that is delivering care. The existing payment system contributes to the increasing costs associated with treating patients for receiving care at PACs and are driving Medicare's determination to change the reimbursement landscape in this space. So in this slide, we're looking at how are PACs currently reimbursed? So PAC spending in Medicare has grown significantly over the years. Uh, for instance, in 2015, Medicare spending on PAC services has totaled $60 billion. So this chart on the slide demonstrates this point. Um, I think we have to go back on. Yep. Um, it comes from a report published in June 2016 by the, by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC, 
which I'll discuss in a bit more detail later on in the presentation, and shows that though Medicare spending on post-acute care has slowed since 2012, there has still been an upward trend in costs for PACs through the years. So there are a number of drivers contributing to this upward trend, such as the growing elderly population, the Medicare population that requires PACs after a hospital stay, and the increasing prevalence of chronic conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and heart disease. Therefore, there is a desire to, came to, to contain costs in this area so this upward trend doesn't continue. So on the next slide, we'll, we'll further look at how PACs are currently reimbursed. CMS pays for services in each PAC setting, as we said, using four different payment systems, uh, units of service, and case mix adjusters, which may result in payment rates that may be too high for certain settings and various payment systems that are inconsistent with each other. So for example, HHAs and SNFs pay more generously for therapy care, such as physical and occupation therapies, than for medically complex care, such as ventilator and severe wound care, which may drive some providers to focus on therapy patients rather than medically complex patients. This may also drive providers to provide unnecessary therapy services to boost payments. The ultimate impact is that because there are four payment systems, the same service performed in different settings is paid for at different rates, regardless of the outcome. This means that patients with similar conditions receiving similar care at different facilities don't always show better outcomes at higher cost settings. Additionally, similar diagnoses do not automatically mean similar functional status, nor do they similarly address co-occurring conditions. And because there's no unified approach to placement decisions, there are wide variations in placement decisions and quality measures with similar patients being placed in different settings with different care plans. Each level of PAC facility also delivers different types of services and have different conditions for admission and regulatory obligations, which means that patients with the same condition can be discharged to different settings, which may lead to vastly different costs depending on where the patient is receiving care. So for example, the chart on the slide comes from 2013 data and shows the average payment per first post-acute care site used. It shows the average cost of care for conditions across HHAs, SNFs, and ERS. Um, and as you can see, indeed, care delivered at an ERF was 30% higher on average than care delivered at a SNF, and spending for beneficiaries discharged to a SNF was on average more than double that for those who received HHA services. So on the next slide, we're going to look at what changes are happening to impact reimbursement of PACs. So over the past few years, CMS and others have undertaken a large number of PAC reform initiatives including efforts to make immediate changes to the prospective payment system for each setting, such as initiatives geared towards reduction in hospital readmissions, um, and the two that are featured on the slide, the Home Health Value-Based Purchasing Program, under which home health agencies' payments will be adjusted based on performance as compared to applicable measures CMS started collecting in target states in 2016, um, under this program, upward or downward pay adjustments will start at 3% in 2018 and rise to 8% in 2022. The other featured program on the slide is the Skilled Nursing Facility Value-Based Purchasing Program, um, SNF VBP, uh, under which CMS has proposed to start a SNF VBP program no earlier than October, two, than October 2018 that would fund payment adjustments to the, to the PPS for SNF using a 2% quality withhold. Under this system, all Medicare SNFs will be ranked according to performance and the highest ranking will receive incentive payments while the bottom 40% will see lower payments. Um, <clears throat> but the biggest change occurring in the reimbursement area affecting PACs is the shift to a unified payment system for PAC services uh, proposed beginning in 2021 with a three-year transition as recommended by, Med by MedPAC, the Medicare Advisory Commission. So MedPAC's primary role is to advise Congress on issues affecting the administration of the Medicare program, and Medicare administrators and policymakers rely on MedPAC's recommendations and advice and use this information to evaluate services Medicare covers and ways to improve care. Um, the Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act of 2014, which is also known as the IMPACT Act, can be considered the impetus for these changes in the in PAC payment. Um, the IMPACT Act required MedPAC to develop a prototype prospective payment system spanning PAC settings to help contain the cost of payment for these services by tying payments to patient characteristics and outcomes 
uh, based performance measurement. In undertaking the development of a unified PPS spanning all PAC settings, MedPAC considered patient characteristics such as age, reason to treat, comorbidities, and based on this data, predicted the cost of stays for most patient groups. So ultimately, if such a system is implemented, a unified PAC PPS would redistribute payments among types of stays and settings with the objective of basing payment on patient characteristics rather than setting or the amount of services furnished. So payments would decrease for rehabilitation care unrelated to patient characteristics. For example, for patients recovering from hip surgery who receive high amounts of, of rehab therapy services regardless of their care needs, and would potentially increase for medically complex care um, patients with comorbidities that involve multiple body systems. So a unified PAC PPS would result as designed in an increased resources for home health to the detriment of institutional PAC settings. Uh, in its most recent report to, to the Congress, MedPAC identified three issues related to implementation of unified PAC PPS, such as whether the implementation should include a transition period for providers to adjust, whether Congress should consider lowering the level of total PAC payments when the PPS is implemented, and what type of enforcement activities should be conducted to ensure compliance with these new rules. Um, a detailed discussion of these, of these issues goes beyond the scope of this session. However, the point is that there may be some challenges to implementing um, a unified uh, system such as this, and therefore, it's not certain how much congressional support a program like this will actually have. But if this still goes through, on the next slide, how will cha the changing reimbursement impact impact deals? So if MedPAC's recommendations regarding change in reimbursement go into effect, a unified Medicare payment system for PACs combined with the shift to value-based payments and quality improvement would emphasize patient acuity and preference over the setting in which care is delivered. Payments would be redistributed from less complex care to more medically complex care, from higher cost settings like LTACs and ERFs to lower cost settings like SNFs and HHAs, and from higher profit states to lower profit states, which will result in more uniform profitability across them. This is a potential game changer for our M&A work, since under this system, patients that have similar conditions and patient, par and patient characteristics can receive care that is paid the same, but in different settings. So home health agencies, for, in for instance, which historically have a lower overhead than their PAC counterparts, will have an advantage. They have the potential for increasing their revenue through the types of patients they're serving while still maintaining a lower overhead. Additionally, those deals in this space have been um, on a decline, there's a speculation that a change in reimbursement structure could breathe new life into this space, as there may be potential for increased earnings in existing PACs and opportunities for collaboration between high quality PACs, acute care hospitals, and PACs, and providers delivering these services. So finally, what are some, what are some things that you should consider moving forward? Well, first is the valuation of risk. The change in reimbursement of PACs does not need to deter transactions in this space. However, when evaluating whether to move forward with a deal, interested parties should consider the evaluation of risk. For instance, if you're interested in, in acquiring an ERF today, consider how the payment structure may impact the revenue of that ERF five years from now. And in calculating that risk, account for that in deal valuation. Um, secondly, such a change in reimbursement may result in different strategies moving forward, such as collaboration with other high quality PAC providers through M&A or otherwise, um, since some facilities may be disadvantaged by this change, it might be beneficial to consider a strategic partnership with, with a provider that would be benefiting from the changes. Additionally, acquiring targets with lower overhead may result in an increased revenue potential in the long run. For instance, a home health agency typically has lower overhead costs because of the services they provide and providers employ as opposed to an ERF with higher overhead. However, this is not to say that there are not still opportunities to invest in PACs with typically higher overhead like LTACs and ERFs, since there will still be patients who will require those services from those PACs. Just be aware that the end goal here is about value-based care and making the delivery of care more efficient while still containing costs. Therefore, especially if these changes go into effect, evaluate the risk of investing in a higher cost PAC, but also consider how to improve the efficiency of care delivery in this type of PAC. Um, finally, continue to understand this new payment structure. Uh, under this new payment structure, payments and costs will shift from certain types of patients and services to others. 
Um, as we said before, uh, medically complex patients with comorbidities will likely receive increased payments as compared to those patients requiring less compl complicated rehabilitation services. So margins may decrease in some areas and increase others. Um, these considerations are all important to monitor when considering the value of a business, both in the pre- and post-transaction stage, and we will keep monitoring these changes as they go into effect in the near future. So thank you. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you, Elena, for the wonderful presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to follow up with Elena directly um, via phone or email. And this concludes today's webinar. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, Epstein Becker Green will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. We hope you will join us for the upcoming webinars in this series taking place every Tuesday in November at 2 p.m. Eastern. The next webinar takes place on November 21st and we'll discuss post-acute care details from diligence to closing. For additional details, or to watch the recordings of previous sessions, visit www.ebglaw.com. Thank you and have a great day.